Hello, um, good uh, evening and uh, welcome to um, our session uh, in uh, the European uh, Big Data Value uh, Forum. Uh, we are going to uh, start this, uh, this uh, session that is running in, in parallel to the main track. So uh, for those uh, joining us, we, we really appreciate and we understand that we are competing uh, against a very similar uh, uh, theme that we have in the main track. That is actually how we are going to build the European uh, common data space. But here, what we want to share with you is uh, actually how we have already been started to, um, to build this uh, European industrial data space. And this uh, session is actually um, driven by the project Boost. Uh, for all participants, except uh, for the speakers, please uh, make sure that you mute your, uh, your microphones uh, and uh, please make sure that you use the uh, WOVA question and answer chat so, so we can follow your, um, uh, your inquiries. Uh, in this uh, uh, session, it's a session organized by uh, Sergio Gusmeroli and, and uh, myself. Uh, Sergio is a research coordinator uh, from the Poly uh, Politecnico de Milano, and uh, I work for, uh, for Innovalia, I'm managing director of Innovalia and the uh, project coordinator of uh, Bush 4.0, that is uh, one of the uh, lighthouse uh, projects under the VDVA uh, PPP. Uh, lighthouse projects are projects of uh, particular relevance in the context of the VDBA family because they are projects that are in principle really huge uh, because they bring together the whole ecosystems of uh, a particular vertical. In this case, it is industry, industry manufacturing that is uh, that uh, we are trying to, um, to deal with. And throughout three years, because we are really facing the last months of the project, we have been investigating how uh, big data can actually transform and change and improve the competitiveness of what we are doing in the context of uh, manufacturing. In this session, we want to focus on one specific item. As I was uh, uh, very briefly uh, introducing, we are and we have been uh, working on the setup of the foundations and the first step towards the implementation of a common data sharing space for and in manufacturing. Uh, what we want to share with you is actually what are the final outcomes that we have been able to uh, implement. In terms of ecosystems, you can actually see that uh, the representation of the digital, of the knowledge and of the factory manufacturing domain um, uh, stakeholders in Europe is actually uh, very relevant and very significant. Uh, not only the big champions of uh, this type of uh, big platforms for um, big data or the uh, champions of industry are present in the consortium, but also small and medium enterprises uh, are represented here because big data is not something that is uh, just simply thought for big companies. It should also be friendly and should empower uh, the transformation of our small and medium enterprises in the manufacturing sector. Uh, for those of you that are attending this uh, webinar, or maybe later, you will see this as an offline uh, video that uh, uh, you will navigate. Please do not uh, forget that we have an exhibition. We have a booth where you can find additional information on the pilots that we will not be able to, to cover here today. But uh, also very importantly, do not forget to like us. We are uh, living in the social world, so we love likes. So please do not forget to press this uh, little uh, uh, heart that you will see uh, in the screen. So uh, do not hesitate, like us. And uh, moving to uh, the actual uh, agenda, uh, what we have prepared for you is actually uh, the, the presentation of uh, three very different uh, uh, experiences that we have performed throughout the project. You will see in the first case how a company that was uh, starting with a relatively modest uh, pilot in the project has uh, um, very quickly evolved into a very large demonstration of a very powerful proof of concept in terms of how we can deal with our change uh, in the Industry 4.0 domain. Then we will also learn how uh, data spaces, data sharing spaces are transforming the way in which big groups, 
big multinationals are, are actually dealing with their uh, maintenance services and problems. Also, we will learn some experience on how big companies like uh, Philips in this case have team up with uh, small and medium companies, not only to bring their um, their results forward to attain their objectives uh, through advanced uh, data analytics, but also uh, empowering these companies through cooperation to replicate these type of services so we can increase impact. And finally, we want to uh, present to you some initiative that we are uh, basically announcing in this uh, big event, that is uh, the development of a new ecosystem, of a new community that is intending to continue uh, the effort of uh, bringing big data into the industry 4.0 to sustain uh, the big community that uh, Boost 4.0 has been able to build and now that is open to the rest of the industry. So with no further uh, delay, so I don't want to steal uh, time from, from the speakers, I would like to introduce uh, the team uh, that is uh, composed by Alessandro Canepa from um, Piacenza and Fabiana uh, Fournier from uh, the team of IBM in uh, Israel. So the floor is yours and uh, let's try to see how we can go from the seat to the shop. Thank you. Thank you, Oscar. I will share my screen. I think you can start, Alessandro. Okay. Thank you, Fabiana, and uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, the invitation uh, to introduce our uh, our experience in the Boost project. So um, I represent Piacenza company. Piacenza, we can go on next slide, please. Okay, uh, and with Fabiana of uh, IBM, uh, we have uh, worked uh, leading uh, an activity on the side of the traceability based on the blockchain technology in the field uh, of textiles. So uh, what is important to state is that uh, Outside Europe, because we have to divide the domains between European and not European companies, textile uh, is uh, uh, one of the most polluting uh, sectors. It plays a significant role with more than 1.7 million tons a year of CO2 emissions and 10% uh, uh, of the global substances of potential concern. Of Oops. I think we lost Alessandro. Yeah. Alessandro, sorry, you were muted by, by mistake. Can you unmute yourself? Okay, but, now right. you. I am back again? Yes. yes. Okay, so uh, outside Europe, uh, uh, almost 90% uh, of the workforce uh, is below living wages and uh, uh, permitted to the lower cost, especially for the fast fashion companies, uh, Currently, it's astonishing to say, but a garment is worn an average of three times in its life cycle. This means that more than 400 billion, no, sorry, 400 billion are lost a year uh, to this, because of the discarding of the clothing and more than 90 million tons of fashion waste are generated each year. Um, next slide, please. Thank you, Fabiana. So uh, what is the positive uh, fact is that uh, uh, more than 60% of the consumers now are ready to pay more for products uh, where the sustainability is proven. This is a, a, an analysis made by Nissan in 2015. And currently, the situation is uh, even improved than five years ago. Then what? It happens is that we witness a flourishing of the new solution of brands uh, who pretend to declare their commitment uh, to preserve the environment. But in reality, this is not fully true because uh, what I usually say is that there is no sustainability without uh, the traceability of the production because you can claim everything, but uh, you have to demonstrate this. So uh, what happens is that uh, we have a very uh, complex value chain characterized by the high opacity because of the number of passages from the raw materials to 
the clothing and therefore it is very difficult to verify the implementation of real sustainable approaches. And uh, European nations also stated that, that the transparency of the value chain is a crucial enabler to do this job, analyzing and proving the real implementation of sustainability in our sectors. What I, can, what I have also to state it, is that European production, European manufacturers have um, a very, very good position in this because uh, Europe has been always uh, one of the pioneers in the uh, legislation to protect the environment, the workers, uh, and uh, the ethical sustainability of the value chain. Therefore, European companies, especially SMEs, has uh, a great chance to take an advantage from this uh, traceability approach because uh, they are the first who are in the position to prove because they have to do already now their sustainability approaches uh, towards the environment and also towards uh, the workers. Okay, next slide please. Okay, so uh, what we have tried to, to do with the IBM is to set up an approach which can prove the sustainability, collecting all the information necessary to do this by all the partners in the value chain, uh, in the textile value chain, from the raw material to the delivery of the fabric. But not only to collect this information, but also to save them by blockchain so that they can be secured and they prove the real uh, adoption of this approach to any uh, stakeholder who can be interested to do that. So we uh, focused especially on the preferential certification of origin, which is the one used also by customs, therefore it is a standard all over the world and can be adopted by any company using standardized information which are contained into the document on transport and invoices, which obviously all the companies have available everywhere. Okay, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, some facts about the company. Uh, currently, Piacenza, in 2019, because we have also to say a couple of words about COVID, but uh, last year we uh, reached 50 million euro uh, of turnover. The company was is one of the oldest of the world. It was founded uh, in uh, 1733 and it is still owned by the Piacenza family. Currently it has more than 200 employees. Uh, last year it reached 260 and we are suppliers of all the fashion groups such as Louis Vuitton, Burberry, Gucci, Prada, The Caring Group, uh, Hermes, Dior, mainly in the women's market. Uh, our characteristics is the customization of the production. More than 30% of the fabrics uh, are customized for the customers. And uh, uh, our average price is around 70 euro per meter, meaning uh, a cost of uh, 3,000 euros. And this is the average. Uh, we are uh, distributed in Italy and abroad. Our customers are mainly abroad. And finally, the lead time for the delivery of the fabrics is around 60 90 days. Okay, next slide please. Okay, then I leave the word to Fabiana uh, for the technical introduction of our pilot. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandro. I think someone is not muted. Thank you. Hello, everybody. This is Fabiana Fournier. I work at the IBM Research Lab in Haifa, Israel, and I will go um, briefly over the uh, proof of concept that uh, we have uh, and we implement it in uh, the scope of the Boost EU project. So as I, Alessandro said, we are focusing, our ship to shop scenario focuses on the on part of the textile supply chain, our stakeholders, the ones uh, that are participating in our blockchain network that uh, we built are the customs suppliers, the fabric manufacturers, third parties such as spinning companies, and the buyers. And if we take a look at the, these, uh, the list of these stakeholders, we can see that they can get many, many benefits from applying the blockchain solution to their textile supply chain. 
uh, we're not, I'm not going to go over all these uh, words, but in essence, if we can uh, summarize the, the, the main words, uh, we're looking for provenance. That means we're looking at the history of an item from the beginning to the end. Uh, we can get traceability, transparency, trackability. We can get um, uh, minimize, uh, minimization in, uh, or reduction in counterfeit. And we can uh, have a tightly um, monitoring of the documents and assuring of their validity. This is very important as we see and we will see next. Another look at the process, as Alessandro mentioned, the process is very complex. In fact, this is a really simplification of it. Uh, in reality, we have more than 70 stages or passages. Uh, just for the sake of, the, of this talk, we will focus on the main ones. Uh, here, as we say, we're looking at the ship to shop. So we are looking at the moment, the raw material, this is the wool or the fine wool that enters a Piacenza's uh, premises. Uh, they go through washing, then spinning, then weaving, finishing, and uh, as the fabric is ready, uh, the fabric is uh, sold to the buyer. Of course, there are many, many other stages as uh, quality control and other more than they're not uh, stated here. But uh, also important to note is that along each of these steps, we have documents. And the documents are very important since blockchain enables us to verify the authenticity of the documents and their uh, validity. Uh, particularly, we are following uh, four different types of documents. We have invoices, we have advices, which are the documents that go with an item when the item goes from one place to another. The advice is issued by the sender and is signed by the receiver when it receives the item. We have production orders or POs, and we have the PCO, the Preferential Certificate of Origin, that is used by customs. So um, another uh, overview of the process, this is important to understand why we uh, need to really um, tightly monitor the PCOs. PCOs are a, a self-declaration document. Uh, that means that Piacenza issues a PCO um, that enables a reduction in duties uh, for the buyers at any customs in the world. Nowadays, when a custom anywhere receives a PCO, they call the customs in Italy, we uh, actually uh, arrive at Piacenza uh, facilities in the north of Italy, and they are uh, for the validation of the PCO. The PCO requires that at least two fundamental transformation steps are carried out on European soil. Usually we're talking about the spinning and the weaving steps. The spinning is a transformation since it transforms wool into yarn, while the weaving transforms yarn into fabric. So if, if they can prove that at least two transformation steps are done, then the buyers can get, uh, get taxes uh, reduction. Some of the use case characteristics which uh, actually have implications on the um, implementation we carried out. First of all, we're talking about very small uh, production of small batches of very expensive items. Uh, we need to comply to the EB's 4.0 fashion supply chain standard. We need to um, have some rules for enforcement of, uh, for example, models for quantities or regulation rules, so we can uh, apply them in the smart contracts and enforce them during runtime. We need to track over different product codes per each company for same item. That means that an item can be called differently by different companies. We need to keep a bidirectional connection between the trace items and documents, meaning for a trace item, we need to keep track of all the documents related to it and vice versa. And we have a requirement for full traceability, trackability, transparency, and trust among the stakeholders in the network. Of course, the last bullet is inherent in any blockchain network that uh, we will use. This is a picture of the components 
on, only one uh, comment, please uh, uh, be aware of the time that uh, yeah. yeah, we need to keep uh, some, some time for the rest of the webinar. Thank you. Yes. Uh, so this is a high level overview of the solution. We have three main components. We have the blockchain backend, which is implemented in Hyperledger Fabric. In fact, it was implemented on the IBM blockchain platform, IBP in IBM Cloud. We expose REST APIs. Uh, we have a wrapper that connects the ERP, the ERP extensions that have been made. So we can extract real data from the ERP and feed this data into the ledger. Uh, this wrapper also connects the web UI for the different stakeholders, so we can show the provenance of the items and the documents in a tree structure, and it connects also to the document management uh, storage in the company. I will skip the blockchain solution architecture. As I said, it was done using fabric, uh, Hyperledger Fabric. The code of the backend was released as open source under the Apache version 2 license. The achievements, if I can summarize in two slides, the main achievements. First of all, we have a blockchain based solution that includes the backend. As I said, it was released as open source. So anybody that uh, would like to implement such solution can uh, take it as a base. We have the data model, we have the APIs, we have the web UI for the different stakeholders, showing a very nice way how we can track the items and the documents. And we have done also the integration with the Agenda CRP system. We have two complete demos that uh, we can uh, show with the corresponding scripts, documents, and movies. Beyond the blockchain implementation, we also took one of the demos and implemented it on, on top of the IBM Transparent Supply Platform uh, called IBM BTS. If someone is familiar, it was formerly called IBM Food Trust. We were the first ones to demonstrate that we can take the platform for food and actually apply it for a um, use case in the domain of textile uh, supply chain. We have a public a movie about this uh, work. We were selected by the European Commission Innovation Radar. And we have some other exploitation activities. We have uh, several times in news in the IBM Research Slack channel. We have presented our work um, to IBM executives, especially people from the IBM BTS. Uh, who we'll take very seriously our comments regarding the platform and how, and how to use it. And we are on a press release, which is uh, under preparation. So uh, that's it from our side. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Fabiana. As I mentioned, we will take uh, uh, questions uh, at the end of the of the webinar. So we, without uh, more delay, I, I would like to, to give the floor to, to Sebastian. Uh, from uh, from Hofer that will be presenting uh, uh, mainly results coming from uh, a pilot that has uh, been driven mainly by the company Bentler. But I guess uh, Sebastian, you will also um, uh, introduce uh, this as part of your uh, of your presentation. Uh, re remember always to unmute yourself before you you start uh, uh, speaking. So the floor is yours, uh, Sebastian. Yes, uh, thanks for the introduction, Oscar. Um, you're able to hear me and see the slides, I think? Perfect. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, so as Oscar uh, has introduced, um, I, I will uh, talk about the predictive maintenance pilot, which is one of the 10 pilots within the Boost uh, 4.0 project, um, which is um, at the plant of Bentler Automotive. So um, unfortunately today, Mr. Köchling from Bentler Automotive um, won't be, uh, wasn't able to make uh, to the talk today, so I will also be in, uh, representing Bentler. Just uh, to give uh, you a brief introduction um, to myself and uh, also my inst institution, um, I'm part of the Fraunhofer Institute. If you're not familiar with the Fraunhofer Institute, so it's one of uh, uh, Germany's biggest research institutions um, with uh, I think more than 70 institutes all over Germany. And we are one of these uh, institutes uh, within Paderborn with a um, focus on uh, industry 4.0 and intelligent, uh, intelligent technical systems. So what are our core com competences? Um, uh, it's of course technological competence in terms of data analytics, for example, as well as other uh, technologies within industry 4.0, which is for example, AR and VR. But we also view these technologies in, uh, as part of advanced systems engineering. So how to uh, um, yeah, construct uh, complex 
technical systems. Um, then also uh, how to make uh, a benefit um, or value out of it in terms of strategic product and technology planning and also implications for the future of work. So we have been um, collaborating very closely with the Bentler Automotive, um, which, um, yeah, Bentler is within the production of uh, safety relevant products, uh, services and systems for energy, automotive and engineering sectors. And uh, as we are working closely with uh, Bentler Automotive, which is also um, located in Paderborn, um, it centers around uh, automotive components. Um, it has originally been a medium-sized German company and has had developed within the last uh, about 10 years into a global enterprise. So uh, Bentler Automotive is uh, the development partner for the world, uh, world's leading automobile manufacturers. And it offers tailored solutions um, for their customers, so for these automobile manufacturers, um, and also engineering services. And last but not least, uh, the production of components for, uh, for car parts. Um, what components um, are we talking about here? Um, these are chassis and chassis modules. They're also in the business of um, uh, yeah, electrical cars. Uh, so battery storage is one important topic at Bentler now, but also powertrain components, crash management systems and structural components. And within the smart maintenance um, pilot in Boost Forward, we're focusing on the structural components which are produced um, also in a plant um, in Paderborn. So what's uh, the initial situation within this plant, with this, within this uh, structural component uh, project production plant? Um, we are focusing here on forming of these structural components. Uh, so we have a complex um, production line here. Um, we have a hot press, a hot forming press, which is a hydraulic press system, as well as um, other components um, within the production system. For example, oven systems, um, we have uh, belts for delivering, we have robotic systems which are handling um, the sheet metal parts. So uh, the, uh, the maintenance of this complex production line is of course a complex uh, process. In this uh, pilot for smart maintenance, we're um, also working with Atlantis Engineering, which is a technology provider for this pilot, as well as uh, its OWL, with this, uh, which is a, a local um, network of uh, SMEs, which is uh, also um, considering um, uh, yeah, the um, transfer to other companies of this know-how. So within this plant, um, um, in the hot forming line, uh, the objective is to automatically uh, detect uh, failures and also give recommendations for actions. So an automized uh, detection of faults and failures, and uh, in the best case also prediction ahead um, of the failure, um, is one concern on the technical level. But then also how uh, will this uh, recognition, this detection be integrated into the um, maintenance and also the production process was also a big question. Then how to connect um, maybe solution com uh, components within the um, interconnected uh, factory was also an important question. Um, so this is why we will also talk about this um, uh, common data spaces and data sharing spaces uh, to connect uh, these uh, solution components at the end. Um, so the vision that we have here is illustrated here on the right, a machine health monitor. So very uh, simple interface, which integrates quite um, well within uh, the maintenance process, but which also in, uh, aggregates very uh, brief in an overview, the health status of these different components um, of the hot forming line. Um, yes, uh, so how has Bentler uh, tackled the solution to this problem? Um, they uh, addressed it um, not by solving a sim simple use cases and uh, single use cases, isolated use cases, but they set up a smart production data platform. So this is a, a platform where all of the production data is centrally located and collected. Um, for Bentley, it is of uh, high importance uh, that uh, the data ownership, uh, ownership lies within Bentley. So this smart production data platform um, has been developed and is also currently maintained by the Bentler IT. And they also have a central uh, industry for that O team, 
which is centrally located um, um, above all the plants and is then multiplying the know-how and as well as the um, technical infrastructure to all of the plants. So on the condition monitoring level at plant level, it provides uh, various dashboards solutions, which um, are um, yeah, also visualized here on the left side, which are connected directly to the smart production data platform. So when starting this project, we started at the plant Andertale, the Paderborn plant, um, which is uh, yeah, like the, the pilot plant within the Boost for the Dog project. But we also wanted to transfer this uh, to other plants. To, so we have more than 70 uh, plants all over Germany and Europe um, where this can be transferred to. How, this, uh, how did we transform this to a cross-plant smart maintenance platform? So at uh, the Andertale plant, we have uh, close to 2,000 different signals, which um, provide um, about 40 billion data points per year. So altogether, we also have an amount of uh, three years of uh, historical data available here, as well as other fragmented data sources. This can be from MES systems, uh, from the ERP systems, as well as quality management and shift books. So in order to make this, uh, all this data and this diverse data available and, and also make this available for other use cases, so not just smart maintenance, but also, for example, smart quality cases, we have all of this data um, from the Paderborn and the Tale plant, as well as other plants. So currently we are um, piloting with two more plants mirrored in one central time series database. So we have a smart production data platform with a uh, mirrored in FluxDB, which uh, serves um, all of this data in one central combined location. And also on this central location, we have available the uh, visualization with common tools like Grafana and also anomaly and fault detection. Um, this platform is also built in a way uh, to make it uh, transferable very easily with the platform management. Uh, so also very industry common um, systems which are applied here. Um, so dockerized components, dockerized anomaly and fault detection, which is then transferred uh, to other plants uh, via Kubernetes and Rancher. So what are the um, main uh, hurdles we had to take uh, to implement um, a predictive maintenance use case? Let me focus on uh, one of the use cases um, that we have uh, yeah, focused on um, Boost 4.0, which is a scrap belt, um, a scrap belt which connects uh, several of these production lines. So it's uh, of quite importance because um, a fault in the scrap belt uh, will uh, bring a halt to uh, several of these production lines. So if, um, importance uh, for starting the data analytics process and developing of uh, data analytics cases was uh, domain understanding and also data understanding, where we used a common description um, of the various components of the scrap belt. So in a very simple way here, we don't have any electronic uh, descriptions, but a very simple description um, where also uh, typical failures can be um, found very easily and also tr be traced back to components, for example, the electrical motor and also the data sources connected to these components uh, which makes it quite easy to understand uh, the sources and also the ways to, um, to identify the faults. So based on uh, this uh, domain and data understanding, uh, we developed the data analytics, which is mainly based on anomaly detection methods. Uh, so uh, because we have very few training examples, um, supervised learning cannot be applied and we uh, applied various animal detection methods where a normal model is trained um, on normal data and then the deviations from this normal model are detected. So one example, which has also been provided by um, Atlantis Engineering, the technology provider, uh, is the MCOT method. So this is a micro clustering based um, outlier detection method where you can easily see, um, for example, for uh, the engine uh, current, um, of the scrap belt, outliers can be very safely detected here. Um, one takeaway was that, was that um, already very simple use cases may lead to effective results. So it uh, has not um, always uh, needs to be a complex machine learning here, um, but even a rule-based warning based on a centrally located uh, data platform 
can uh, bring quite a big benefits and can also be transferred very easily to, uh, to other plants. And uh, one more takeaway uh, when developing this data analytics uh, was the integration of ex expert knowledge. Um, so as I said before, we have very few training examples available, which makes uh, supervised machine learning difficult. So the integration of expert knowledge is key here. Um, so just to give you one example, uh, when working with the hydraulic plant, um, we introduced uh, uh, rules um, which considered the stabilization time of oil levels. So this is important. Um, expert knowledge was integrated here in through the data, data analytics in terms of hybrid uh, data modeling. So to close um, um, my presentation, um, how has this been integrated within the maintenance process? So uh, from a platform point of view, on these plans, we have the centralized time series database, of, uh, as I've presented before. And um, we've um, split um, the different components of our solution um, into um, components as a data provider, detection algorithms, prediction algorithms, um, fusion methods, as well as reporting systems. Um, so these are single components which can easily be transferred um, in pieces and combined uh, in, in ways so that the transfer is very easily done to other plants. And it is uh, centrally displayed uh, in the dashboard. And we can see here, um, unfortunately no details given, but we can see here we have at plant level these dashboards um, available um, for um, uh, yeah, visualization, but also for interaction. So um, in the future it's also possible, or we also already have a prototype um, available where interaction is possible. So where the maintenance workers can also give feedback, um, which will then uh, improve the prediction and detection within the smart maintenance platform. So, uh, th thank you, Sebastian, for um, for your presentation. I think it is uh, also very very nice uh, to, to to see, and uh, probably is one takeaway that uh, I would like to to highlight that uh, we are not necessarily looking for the most advanced uh, AI to bring the most or the highest uh, impact in industry. We can combine very tough problems with advanced uh, uh, mechanisms, but uh, well-established technologies can also bring. Uh, uh, results and value that can be transferred and it is important to to gain this scale to to also create a business uh, case out of the of the use case and uh, uh, i think this this type of cooperation and this type of um, collaboration between uh, between companies i think it we, we have a very good example in boost boost if i if i may say it is uh, one of the initiatives uh, that uh, i have been involved that has exhibit uh, a highest level of collaboration uh, when you look at the names, it could be or it could seem uh, surprising that uh, such big companies are open for collaboration. But when it comes to big data, actually it is. And uh, maybe the colleagues from, from Philips can uh, introduce us into the challenges they have to face, but uh, also maybe to hint a little bit how they have managed not only to solve uh, their problems in the project, but also to support other people solving uh, theirs. So, uh, Bas, the, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Oscar. Uh, let me share my screen. Oh. Uh, yeah, so um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me. And uh, I'd like to explain a bit to you about uh, the use case uh, of both Philips and in this case, uh, Ria Stone, part of the Visa Bayra uh, global company. And uh, I will share some details about our use case. Uh, Ria Stone will also share something about them. But I think the main takeaway, just like Oscar mentioned, is how can we actually collaborate in this fairly new field uh, and, and uh, share our knowledge and insights to other partners that can learn and, and take uh, interesting concepts from, from bigger companies like Philips oursel uh, ourselves. So uh, we will be speaking together. Uh, I really hope that Paolo already is in the meeting. I haven't checked. But, but... Hi, good morning. Good afternoon, all. Yes, I'm in the meeting. Ah, perfect. Welcome, welcome. Uh, so uh, we will do this uh, together. I will simply skip to the content. Uh, and yeah, like I expressed, uh, so Boost, uh, one of the um, mission and vision, most important things of Boost is uh, within the manufacturing domain, 
It's about a demonstration of realistic measurable and replicable ways. And basically that means that we can, we need to show that the things that we actually do can be proven and standardized and also used by others. And I think this story is uh, basically one of the ways that demonstrate that this is indeed possible. So um, I uh, myself am part of Royal Philips. Uh, I won't take too long to basically introduce uh, Philips as a, as a global company. You're probably all familiar. It's a rather big health tech company. But what you need to know is that in Drachten, uh, it's a small town in the north of the Netherlands, there is a fairly large production site of Philips. It's uh, basically it's, its biggest yet, and it's a combined production and development site. Um, there were there are about 2,000 employees, and uh, the, the manufacturing itself is rather state of the art. So uh, basically, we have 1,000 uh, production machines and pieces of equipment, and they are all connected to our own internal uh, IT network. And we have been doing this for over the last, I suppose, two decades. So uh, yeah, back then it wasn't called Industry 4.0 or it wasn't called Industrial IoT, but yeah, most of these concept, concepts we already had present, uh, I think 15 years ago. And that puts, up, puts us in a really uh, nice role to play to help share our knowledge uh, within Philips, uh, but also of course with, with others. And uh, what's important to, to mention, of course, is that uh, for a factory up in the north, you can imagine that uh, focus on cost delivery is very important. We still need to be able to compete with, uh, well, other, other countries which uh, have lower wages um, and yeah, and we do that by striving to the most technological advanced uh, systems we can, can find. And thus far that has uh, worked out quite well. And so for the Philips use case uh, within Boost, we focused on the uh, injection molding area. And for the people that are not aware, uh, injection molding, it's a fairly generic process. It's used uh, globally everywhere. Uh, and, and most companies that have to manufacture uh, yeah, large quantities of uh, plastic parts, they, they probably use some sort of uh, injection molding process. And the process itself is quite standardized and well known. So that gives us an, a little bit of an advantage when talking about scalability. And Philips Drachten uh, has over 120 injection molding machines uh, and, and Philips globally over 800. I think it's now closer to 900. And yeah, what you need to know, of course, is that plastic part making is a very competitive market. So basically the, 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 the granulate, so the, the, the raw product we put in, it's fairly cheap to buy, while the, the machines we use are typically quite well standardized and, and can simply be bought. So we need to find smart ways of actually uh, keeping a competitive edge. Um, so talking about an injection molding machine in the case of, of Drachten, uh, we, we manufacture about 200,000 plastic parts uh, a day, maybe even a bit more today. And they are all connected to a network. Uh, but, but having a machine connected to a network doesn't necessarily mean that the data they, they potentially have are, are used in the best way. Uh, all of our machines are equipped with an, a human machine interface. So uh, there's quite some, uh, so some possibilities for manually controlling the machines, manu manually controlling settings, uh, and even getting some, some insights from the processes. Uh, we all have a, uh, they all contain, uh, are part of a extensive uh, statistical process control loop to uh, support quality. They are, uh, yeah, they, they, they're based on sample tests. So about every batch we take a few samples, they are being measured or scanned or identified as either good or bad. And if everything is found to be okay, then we can release a batch. Um, of course, very important for the injection molding process are the tools that we put in the machine. Uh, so yeah, we need to, to know a bit more about the tooling. For example, counters, maybe some maintenance history, some other specifications. Uh, other important inputs to the uh, injection molding process are uh, the raw material, uh, also energy or basically energy consumption is a very good trigger in the sense of how well the machine is performing and cooling because uh, you also need to cool the uh, process down because they get fairly hot. And of course we have a lot of outputs and what is what maybe most people do not really realize is that for example, a typical injection molding machine, if, if unfiltered will present you with about 10,000 parameters per shot. 
and a shot is basically a simple production cycle. Uh, and yeah, the typical cycle time in Drachter at least is about five to eight seconds. So you can imagine that these machines can generate a whole bunch of data. Of course, data is just data. It's not turned into information or into knowledge. And that is of course, basically the end goal because the, the, the knowledge we can use to become, can we can use to become better or improve our processes. Uh, this story will focus more on the local setup. So uh, yeah, making sure that we can, uh, can do things on the shop floor for our operators, support them with uh, key decisions, show them how the process is running, give them alert and, and do some smart visualizations. But of course, what's always very interesting in this field is the globalization, so to say. So can we pick up the things that we develop, make them like sort of plug and play uh, options, make them scalable and centrally managed, a standardized data structure. So that all has to do with, with scalability outware. And of course, when we talk about replication, that's also a very interesting notion. So how can we make this happen? Uh, just a little bit more on, on uh, the, the, the local business value when we talk about injection molding. Uh, I, I won't go into all the details, but typically you have to imagine that, yeah, there, we have raw input material that we scrap. We, we have products that are not of a uh, good quality where we scrap also quite, quite a lot. It also has to do because the, the, the material itself is not that expensive. So it's sometimes easier to simply scrap a bit more products than to go through the entire uh, uh, after rework of your uh, product quality. Uh, and what we see in this picture is that, that probably most costs are not necessarily involved in the products, but it's basically uh, the time needed whenever we have a larger escalation to identify what was the root cause or to find out what we need to do or change or repair or whatever in order to make sure the process is running again. And uh, yeah, then we come up to a potential of about 100,000 uh, products per machine per year, which is, well, I think it's a rather a big uh, potential. So, uh, and this is more about scalability. I will simply go through this, but uh, we have the vision started with a boost project that we can make these, these uh, solutions scalable in the end, and not only for the Drachten factory, but of course also for other sites in uh, Philips. So how we did this, this is the uh, Boost reference architecture. Uh, it was developed within the Boost project itself. And in order to explain to each other what we are actually doing, we mapped our, uh, our, our idea, our concept and our solution on top of this. And, and I won't go through all the details, but basically what we wanted to do is come up with a plug and play solution for, for an injection molding independent of brand type age or communication protocol, which is a typical challenge when we talk about injection molding. Uh, come up with a way to build interactive dashboards using open uh, standards. So probably more web-based kind of uh, standards, real-time insights and alerts. Um, try to come up with, with models that describe our process to provide real-time advice and, and control actions. And of course, also bring those insights uh, back and, and try to make more um, uh, future forward-looking initiatives. So we get more insights, better understanding, but also our predictability will improve. And eventually this is what we made. So this is more like a technical architecture. And what is pretty cool to see, at least I find it very cool, is that you see a lot of the concept we started out with in the Boost uh, project, they were, everybody was, was, was thinking yeah, along the same lines, but you can now clearly see that, there, uh, that some things are being, uh, so to say, standardized. So when we talk, uh, uh, look at the last talk of Sebastian, you probably will see some, some uh, similarities here. Uh, we chose to have a streaming Kafka bus also with a bunch of microservices attached. Uh, the microservices can be managed uh, also using Rancher and a Kubernetes instead of, uh, for example, a InfluxDB, we use an Inmation, which is an off the shelf product based on MongoDB. But basically the whole idea is the same. What's probably different is that we can also uh, query data from our MES systems we have available on the shop floor. And for us, the main challenge, and that's where our partners are really helping out is how can we standardize the, the connectivity of our injection molding machines? So from that movement onward, everything can be modular, standardized and very easily 
scalable. And this picture is what we shared with our replication partner. Uh, and, and they took also, so they visited our site. We, we shared to large extent the technologies we chose and why. Just from to end my part of the story, some key results. So we have now 10 machines connected, probably scale up to 20 very soon. We've collected about 100 gigabytes of raw time series data. Uh, yeah, we developed a whole new microservice architecture. Uh, yeah, we, we shared uh, the, our, our technology and the standards uh, we, we, we came up with. Uh, the architecture includes uh, EIDS and cloud connectivity. So we can also uh, allow uh, other partners to work on our data or share it with other factories. It's actually tested on the shop floor, something that is one of my passion, so to say, is, is okay, it's great to have technologically advanced solutions, but how can we actually deploy them successfully on the shop floor? It's a challenge on its own. And uh, yeah, expected benefits, and we're currently validating this, is that we see yeah, around uh, 10 to, to 20 percent uh, improvement with respect to quality levels, maintenance levels, stop time, and uh, yeah, much less time being used whenever we have some sort of escalation. Uh, to keep some time available for the others, uh, let's go to our replication partner. Thank you, Bas, and uh, maybe Paolo, you can uh, you can take it from there. Yes, thank you all for the opportunity to share our replication experience with Philips. Uh, we would start with a small video about Histon, just to give a little bit of, uh, um, let's say, knowledge about our factory. I would ask Bas to start with it. I would very much like to do that, but <laughs> as always, of course. Ah, look, here we go. In in any case, Paulo, I think uh, the, maybe we will um, uh, we will not hear the the sound. So so maybe you can talk over the you can talk uh, okay. the video. So basically, we see that uh, Histon is part of a large economic group. It's a, a factory that is mainly focused on, the, on uh, fabricating ceramics for uh, table, regular tableware. Uh, it has only one customer, contrary to many other factories in Europe. We only work for IKEA. So uh, our main export uh, pipeline is IKEA. So we, we started in 2014. We have about, uh, at the moment, 280 workers. And we just undergone a big expansion of the factory. Uh, the main um, and most important, I think the main characteristics of, of the factory is that we developed another new uh, fabrication um, process for uh, tableware ceramics. It's called single, single firing. Uh, this means that normally ceramics go through two oven firings, uh, one after forming and another one after glazing. In order to bring our cost down and, and to be able to be competitive within the um, IKEA workspace, we developed this new process. It is possible to use this new process because the factory is completely automated. This meaning that from the isostatic presses until the quality control, uh, no one touches uh, one single piece of tableware. So there's no human intervention. It's all handled by, by machines. And this brings uh, a lot of um, massification possibilities. We can, we can produce more at a lower cost. Uh, with no, this lower human intervention and also have a lower than average in, in the ceramics market um, failure rate. So um, what you can see is that we have a lot of, uh, it's a shame that we don't have the sound, but we, are, we, we find a lot of problems in, uh, at the end of the fabrication line. It's very difficult at the moment because we, we don't yet have traceability. That is something that we're going to implement in the next... Uh, yeah, I think, Baz, you can, you can take now Paulo out or stop the video and go to the next slide. Yeah. Because we cannot hear the speech, so... So um, basically, the pro we identified uh, since the beginning of the project that uh, the Philips Dachten, Dachten was the most similar to Riestone among all other pilots. It's an inline factory. So uh, from stop to end, uh, everything grows through the same process. It we have the same type of machines. So we also do 
they do plastic molding, we do uh, table air pressing, and um, uh, we have the same challenges. This meaning the data collection from the machines, data processing, organization, and then the data treatment. Um, we started this, this is as, as is, but it should be as, as it was, it's not like that anymore. So uh, we have this uh, 19 lines of high volume isostatic presses. So this is a big scale ceramics factory. Bas, can you go to the next slide, please? So uh, we were on the normal uh, status of everybody that uh, possesses such type of, of factory. Uh, we have basically very uh, complex machines that, uh, for instance, uh, Bas was speaking about a shot uh, that has a thousand different uh, data collected, we have the same. So our fact, our, our machines, each time they, they, they press a plate, they also give us cents or hundreds of different uh, parameter readings. Um, this um, this uh, data was basically being lost. Uh, it is all based or, or, or deposited on FIFO uh, type of uh, data streams. So we, it was not being used for anything uh, uh, at all. Uh, we could not do any root cause analysis or correlation between data. And basically when we started working with, with the, the Philips factory, we found uh, uh, a way to, in, to implement a number of different automated processes that could give us some insights from the data that we could collect from our very complex machines. Uh, Bas, can you go to the next one, please? So as, as you see, we started by, um, you, you can see on the top left, our in, pictogra in the pictogram uh, uh, format, our um, fabrication process. So we have the, uh, ceramics input into ceram ceramic based silos. We have the isostatic presses where boost 4.0 is, is focused. We have them glazing, uh, oven firing, operator based control, and then IKEA delivery, okay? So uh, Boost was focused about the press sensor data. We have, uh, as I told you, very complex machines with a number of, uh, I would say, hundreds of different uh, parameters. Uh, from those parameters, uh, we went into defining what we call a DB or a data block. Uh, that, that data block was um, collecting all the different parameters that were directly influencing the quality of, the, of production. Uh, we then went into uh, the first implementation for, for our re first replication of Philips was the connector layer, where we put all this data or, the, or this data block into a capware server. That capware server basically it's, um, makes a, a custom OPC translation to JSON, and then we have our own collection, data collection warehouse uh, in place. Pass, uh, please, the next one. So uh, the replication went. Uh, you can see the first part of the replication on the left side. So you have the legacy layer and the connector layer that was a lot that for the first time was uh, allowing us to have homo homogenized data that we could treat in, in you know, uh, our first internal services uh, where you see shop for microservices on, on, on the right hand side. So this was all uh, being collected, treated, distributed via a Kafka, a Kafka bus, and then uh, treated into the first time, for the first time into a, a mapping layer where we're using uh, IMEC and Uninova um, data homogen homogenization tools. So I have a problem with that word, I cannot really say it well. And then it goes, that data after being, being treated, it goes into the analytics layer and we have some examples um, with Uninova afterwards uh, on the next slides. But still on this slide, then we provide um, an entrance or an information interchange with external uh, data services too. Bas, can you go to the next slide, please? Yep. Paulo, just uh, try to conclude because uh, we, we have yeah. only 10 minute uh, margin uh, beyond uh, three o'clock. So uh, we, we need to give some time uh, or to leave some time for, uh, for Carmen. For Carmen. Yeah, so very quickly, uh, for the first time, then we started using that, for instance, that microservice with Uninova and we could, st could start seeing real data correlations between events from one type and events from the other one. Bas, can you go to the next one? 
So you can see um, density and quality percentage correlations. You can see it very clearly. It, it shows uh, immediately on, on the Grafana visualization. Uh, next one, Blas. Uh, just the same, you can see, you know, event cause and, and outcome. And next one. Just the same, also per shift density, and you can see real, the, really the correlation in the bottom. And I think it was the last one, or maybe we have another slide. No, last. this was it. No, this is this the last one. Okay, so just to tell you um, about our experience, it was a very fruitful experience with the Felix Drachten uh, team. Uh, the, the replication, it's, it's uh, uh, really possible to do the cloning of what they were doing in, in, in Philips Drachten and uh, to clone it directly into our factory. And the results up to now have been very satisfactory. And that's all for me. Thank you. Part. And uh, pro probably for the people that is still with, uh, with us, thank you for those that are, uh, uh, have decided to stay with us till uh, 10 past uh, uh, three. I don't want to steal too much time from, from Carmen, but one of the things that probably you have seen is the huge amount of collaboration that has been generated during this project. So this really motivated us to, to, to see that through this collaboration environment, we have been able to achieve far more than any of the companies, even if they are very big, would have achieved on their own. So why not try to extend this ecosystem? Why should we kill it? Because the commission only decided to uh, fund this project for three years um, if the benefit is uh, out there. So uh, maybe Carmen can motivate us uh, into uh, what next? How do we survive uh, Boost 4.0? Okay, I hope you can see my screen and you can hear me well. I know that I have not too much time, but I should be uh, very fast in, uh, in presenting this. Uh, thanks for everyone for uh, uh, the presentation that uh, let us uh, see the result of, uh, of this project. And connecting to what Oscar was saying, uh, where can we go from, uh, from here? So what our idea, what we propose to boost partners and also to uh, all the people who is uh, listening to this, um, to this panel. Uh, we have created uh, the Digital Factory Alliance um, with other partners, a community to see and be seen, to know and be known. Uh, the objective of this uh, alliance is to give visibility and work on the future development of uh, this digital solution that has been developed in Boost and other projects, and not only a project. The final goal is to build a win-win scenario for digital and manufacturing industries, accelerate the adoption of digital technology with a budget-friendly uh, approach, having a digital transformation balance and at the speed of business growth, and also to guarantee to everyone the freedom of choice for best-in-class and best-in-value a digital solution. The values of the Digital Factory Alliance are uh, indicated here in, uh, in this manifesto. They are invite you to read uh, slowly and carefully uh, by yourself. But maybe uh, if there is one principle that is resume of all the other is the last one, uh, digital uh, for all. What we would like to achieve in the Digital Factory Alliance are a digital solution that are developed and validated from industries uh, for, other, um, for other industries. And uh, the solution are, um, are uh, uh, built with uh, the trust between uh, the providers and, and, and the factory. The solution also are uh, tested through, um, through experiments and, uh, and evidence and validated in a, according to standards that are relevant for us, for uh, the industry. So, uh, what are the uh, transformation assets that the Digital Factory Alliance um, will uh, build together with the community that we are um, we are creating. 
Uh, first of all, we will have a marketplace where you can find the, the digital products that are aligned with the, the values uh, of the manifesto and uh, uh, the reference architecture. We will have a certification framework to validate your solution uh, according to the, uh, to the relevant standards. An innovation campus to spread the knowledge and train the next generation of uh, employees of the digital factories. Experimental facilities to test the processes for next level development. And a digital factory network to find and connect with factory the shares, uh, the shares at our volume. Uh, this initiative, the Digital Factory Alliance, is promoted uh, by uh, Innovalia, Ethos, and, uh, and Engineering. In fact, is open to um, every factories, um, um, manufacturing factories, and uh, technical uh, technological provider uh, to join to join us. So. Uh, the important message is the last one. Join us to the Digital Factory Alliance. You have here the website the, where you can find a, an application form. It is an international trusted community for digital factories to foster knowledge sharing and industrial collaboration to achieve data-driven digital transformation. And uh, for you that uh, participate to this uh, to this panel, there is uh, an early bird offer. Uh, if you uh, reply to our form uh, before by the December 15, you will receive a 20% discount uh, on the membership uh, fee. And also, you have the ability to uh, participate to our initiatives uh, until uh, the end of the of this year. So thank you uh, for uh, uh, for this, and I don't know if there are time for uh, there is some time for questions or uh, for some other comment. Okay. Thank you, Carmen. I'm uh, I, I'm being told by the organizers that uh, the session will close in uh, in one minute. So, uh, unfortunately, I'm not sure if we have uh, time for questions. But uh, in, uh, in any case, uh, what I would do is I would invite uh, the, the, the people in the in the audience again to, to visit um, our booth. If you go into the WOBA platform, uh, you can basically just uh, simply click on the exhibitions and there you will find the uh, Lord Boost uh, 4.0 um, uh, booth. And uh, we have shared with you not only this um, uh, selection of uh, use cases that you have uh, been presented today, but in the booth you can actually share already uh, some very nice uh, presentations from uh, other uh, pilots that are already in place and that have uh, contributed to uh, to create and to generate this uh, community that is an excited uh, community that is really uh, driving the development of um, uh, data-driven uh, innovation in, in Industry 4.0. So uh, from my side, uh, before we, we close, uh, a big thank you uh, to all the, our uh, panelists. Uh, thank you, Sergio, also to be on the on the background, on the shadow, yes, uh, supporting as always. Without you, uh, this would not have um, been uh, able actually. So uh, thank you for your um, quiet uh, support and uh, for giving me the chance to uh, to exploit the uh, the highlight on the spotlight. Uh, yes, uh, yes, now. And uh, for the rest of the people just attending the session, I hope uh, you will have a, a very successful conference that you can uh, enjoy the rest of the of the sessions and. Uh, just yes, uh, in this uh, COVID uh, uh, period, uh, be safe and uh, uh, hopefully we will uh, have the chance uh, to meet each other face to face uh, soon in the in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.